from Psalm 149. Begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in, in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless your holy name. Lord, we thank you in these days that have gone by for camp meeting. Lord, uh, the preaching was great, the singing was great, the exhortation from those in the pews was great, the crowd was great, Lord, the service of our folks was great, the sacrifice was great, Lord, a lot of effort went into those few days, and God, then we come in this morning, and Lord, it is natural for the flesh to just want to have a letdown, but today's the Lord's day. Yeah. Lord, you are worthy of our praise and our adoration. God, we are certainly honored to come before thee this morning. And Father, we ask that you would arrange the atmosphere right now for the preaching of the word of God. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for these that have, uh, Lord, came and taken up their boat in the house of God. But Lord, unless you manifest yourself, all of our efforts will be in vain. And so, Father, we ask that, Lord, you would speak to every heart. We pray that you would edify the saints of God, and we certainly pray in a crowd this size, if there be any amongst us, Lord, that may not be saved, may not be born again, we pray that today would be the day of their salvation. God, I'm glad you know our down-sitting, our uprising. You know the numbers of the hairs on our head. You know the intents and thoughts of our hearts. You know everything. And God, before we ever was, you knew who would be here today. And so, Father, I pray you'd speak to every heart. I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel, and I pray you'd be glorified in our midst because you are truly worthy. Lord, as Brother James just sang, we ought to be beside ourselves, saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, we bless your holy name. Help us now, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. Amen. In these verses, I want you to notice, first of all, our re personal responsibility. In verse number one, the Bible says, Pray the Lord. It didn't say, whoever's next to you, praise the Lord. Who's ever in front of you or whoever's behind you. It said, praise ye the Lord. 31 times in the last three psalms you find the word praise mentioned. But 24 times you'll find in your Bible that the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. If God would have said it one time, that'd been enough. But he reminds us 24 times that our responsibility towards God uh, is to praise him. Uh, you ought to praise him because he gave you strength to get out of bed this morning. Uh, you ought to praise him because he has put breath in your lungs to make your body uh, be able to breathe. Uh, you ought to praise him and that your heart is beating and the blood is th flowing through your veins. Uh, you ought to praise him that you have a nice place to live. Uh, you have clothes on your back. Uh, you have food in your cupboard. Uh, uh, you had something to get you here to church in. Uh, uh, you had enough change left to over from Obama uh, to put some gas in your tank to get here today. Uh, uh, you've got a job. Uh, uh, God's been good to you. Uh, you're living in the best country in the world. Uh, I mean, God has been good to us. Uh, we got to praise Him today. Too many of God's people spend too much time belly aching. We're all reaping better than we sowed. We're faring better than we deserve. And nobody in this building could have anything other to say than this, that God's been good to us. And we see our personal responsibility is to praise the Lord. I want you to notice also our public refrain. Look what it says again in verse number 1. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of, the saint, of saints. When we come to the house of God, 
There ought to be a public refrain. We ought to grab them hymn books with excitement. We ought to sing those songs from the gable end of our soul and bless the Lord. Uh, 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 when uh, 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 the choir's singing, we ought to sing along with them and uh, we ought to shout amen and hallelujah to God. Uh, uh, when specials are being sung, we ought to sing, uh, get involved in it and say hallelujah, praise be unto God. Uh, uh, there ought to be a public refrain of praise to God. Uh, why? Because the Bible says he inhabits the praise of his people. I promise you one thing, we don't praise him enough. But I do promise you this, when you praise him in the right chord, in the right tone, he shows up and he enjoys it. Uh, can you imagine how many people out there cussing him today? How many people are missing a putt on a golf course right now and they're cussing God over it? Uh, how many people are cussing because it's not rained in two days? Uh, how many people are cussing God because of this or that? Blaming God because of this or that? Uh, uh, but I'm here to tell you, everywhere you can find a little assembly of folks uh, uh, that just put all the world out of their mind uh, and they start lifting holy hands toward heaven uh, and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, hey, it's a sweet-smelling savor unto God. Uh, and he he cuts, comes and sits down for a little while uh, and enjoys the fact that somebody recognizes his greatness. We see the personal responsibility, the public refrain, but notice the plea for rejoicing in verse 2. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. You know, we shouldn't be told that we need to be happy. You know why some of you aren't happy? You've been watching TV too much. You've been listening to CNN too much. If you ever watch CNN, the altar is open. Come here and get, get right with God. Uh, that's the wickedest most bunch of I mean, anyway. Uh, some of you have been mm, Facebooking too much. Boy, that was real popular right there. Shows you guilty. Hmm? It's amazing you know everything going on in everybody's business, but you don't even know where Malachi is in the Bible. Hmm? Uh, we shouldn't be told to be happy. You ought to look at where God found you. Look at where you should be in hell. Realize you're not going to hell because the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has washed away your sin. Uh, uh, realize that God's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Uh, uh, realizing God's been good to you. You ought to be happy to be in the house of God. Uh, we shouldn't be reminded to be happy. That's why I used to like Duck Dynasty. I took them off because they referred to God too much. You can still find the reruns, by the way. Uh, I like them. You know what, Phil, you say? I'm happy, happy, happy. Right. Now, if you can be that ugly and have an ugly beard like that and everything and still be happy, 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 you've got to have something. Uh, we see the plea for rejoicing. Hmm? Listen, I know bodily you're wore out. I mean, we've just been in church. However many nights we was in church, I don't even remember I mean, how many messages did we hear? Lord have mercy. How much singing did we hear? I know the flat, the spirit is indeed willing, the flesh is weak. And I know some of you wore out. Some uh, uh, stayed late every night. There were some nights people didn't leave here after 11 o'clock cleaning and getting everything ready for the next service. Uh, and folks got here early uh, and folks were taking care of a lot of things. There's a lot of stress to make sure everything's safe. Listen, I feel like I've been in church three weeks because I have. Three straight weeks I've been in church. It's not getting any easier. I'm heading back out of town this week. Uh, uh, but what, what's going on? I know physically you get wore out. But you still have to have cause to rejoice. God's been good. Hmm? Huh? Well, I enjoyed all that preaching. I enjoyed being in church with my friends. I don't get to see that often. Huh? I enjoyed it. I still ain't got a, I've heard it twice now. I ain't got over that chigger message. I love it. Huh? I ought to rejoice. But then I want you to notice verse number 4. Look at the pleasure of the Redeemer. Verse 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in His people. It didn't say the Lord is angry with His people. It didn't say the Lord was disappointed with His people. 
It says the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. Who are we that a thrice holy God who created everything, who flung the stars out there on nothing and called them by name, who tells the sun when to shine, the God that's uh, in control of everything, that controls all the molecular structure of everything, uh, the God who made the grasshoppers and the birds uh, and the worms uh, and the animals, uh, and God uh, who made all the fish in the sea, uh, and God uh, who knew that oceans had to have salt water uh, and rivers uh, had to have fresh water. Uh, I'm talking about the God of glory uh, that has angels flying over his throne crying, Holy, holy, holy. Uh, I'm talking about the great God of glory, uh, the Lord of lords uh, and King of kings uh, looks at you and I uh, as we heard uh, uh, from Brother Bob the other night, we're just so specks of dirt. Uh, uh, but he looks at us, uh, and he takes pleasure in us. Uh, that word taketh uh, means that he lays hold on. Uh, he reaches out uh, and finds pleasure. Uh, and you and I, uh, and what we're doing around here today, uh, the God of glory takes pleasure in that. If you're here today and you're not saved, you ought to want to get saved just because God will be pleased with you. Huh? He says, The Lord uh, taketh pleasure in his people. I'm going to preach with God's help this morning on how to please the Lord. Boy, I want to please him. I mean, he loved me when nobody else would, he paid my sin debt. He made a way that not only could I be forgiven, uh, but become a, a, a member of the family of God. Uh, and he's going to prepare a place for me in the celestial city of God. Uh, and I'll dwell in the abode of God forevermore. Uh, I sure do want to please him. I want him to look at me, Brother Jim, and, and one of these days say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want him to find fault in me. I want him to be proud of me as one of his children. So how do we please the Lord? Well, first of all, we can please the Lord through obedience. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5 says, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You know, in the New Testament, we're referred to as a peculiar people, but you know when we're peculiar? When we're obedient to God, we obey His voice, we keep His commandments, He takes pleasure in us. We're a peculiar treasure unto God. Deuteronomy 11 says in verse 26, Behold, I have set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day and accursed if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord, but turn us aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Can I say, obedience pleases the Lord. Now my three children are here. They knew early on if they did what was expected of them, it was good at the house. But if they disobeyed, it wasn't so good for them. Can I say, the Bible says if we as parents know how to give good gifts to our children, know how to uh, uh, chastise our children, how much more the great God of glory knows how to take care of us and also chastise us. Can I say, my dear friends, obedience brings blessing. When you obey the Lord, you please Him. Can I say, He does all things well. God is not a tyrant in the rocking chair of heaven just trying to make you uh, 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 go through a bunch of things because he doesn't have anything better to do. Hey, he knows the good way. And he has laid out for us what is best for us. And when we are obedient to his voice, it is good for us. There's not a parent in here that's a true parent that would let their children play out in the street on a busy intersection well, no constraints on them. Just let them go out there and, you know, play in the street. We wouldn't do that. Take a little infant out there and just lay her down there on the 
yellow dotted line there and say, okay, just hang out there for a while, see how it works out. Uh, so preach, that's crazy. Big truck come through and that'd be the end of them. What can I say? God knows where all the big trucks are. God knows where we need to be and where we don't need to be. You see, God not only sees ahead, He sees around every bend, every curve, every turn. God knows what's good for you and what's good for me. And here's God made us. Brother James, God knows there's things that you could handle that I couldn't handle. And there's things that I couldn't handle that you can. And you know, He knows all this stuff. He knows what's good for you, Joseph. And that's why He's given us His Word so we can understand the very will of God. And when we obey Him, it pleases Him. Can I say, we should obey Him in our walk. And by our walk, I'm talking about our attitude. How's your attitude? Hmm? I see some people walk around, yeah, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Here, let me give you a track. Don't you want to be like me and get saved? <laughs> no. I don't want that. Uh Seriously. Some people outside of church, all they do is complain about life and complain about how hard they got it. and Their attitude is terrible. You know your attitude will never get any higher than your attitude. You know where you can get an attitude adjustment? Get in the Word of God and let God straighten you out. But Miss Marcy, I've learned this. There are some people, doesn't matter how much preaching they sit under, doesn't matter how many times they've opened the Bible, they don't do what it says. They rebel against it. They think they know better. They're constantly butting up against the things of God. Can I help you with something? Brother Peter, sheep follow. Goats butt. For every time the message goes forth and they got a problem with it, but preacher, but preacher, they're a goat. Isn't that true, Brother Ron? They're goats. You know what sheep say? Sheep say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever you say, Lord. Some people have an, a perpetual attitude problem, Brother Thad, because they're goats. They're not obedient. Hmm? We should obey them in our walk. We should obey them in our works, our actions. Hmm? Brother Phil, where you at, Dr. Phil? Is it not your testimony? Because I've heard you tell it a few times over the years. Is it not your testimony? That when God saved you, that you was a foul-mouthed, filthy sinner, and he saved you, and he cleansed your soul, and he cleansed your mouth. Isn't that what he did? I've never heard you say a cuss word since I've known you. You go out there foul-mouthed on a job? No, I don't believe you do. Uh, I bet you I'd, I, I'd, I'd just, if I was a bet man, I, I'd bet on the job you'll hear a little praise unto God out of him. Uh I bet you everybody works around him knows he's a Christian. And you say, why do you say that? Our lives, our actions show our works. It's one thing to say you're a Christian, your life will show if you're a Christian. Hmm? It's one thing to tell everybody you're saved, and it's another thing if every other word out of your mouth is foul. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Huh? So if you're outside church and all you're dropping four-letter words, you think that's pleasing God? Hmm? Matter of fact, Brother Josh, it shows me there's a heart problem. Because hmm? what's in your heart comes out your mouth. Huh? You got, you got glory in your heart, it's going to come out your mouth. How you doing, Riker? Missed you, buddy. Shake my hand. Good to see you. Say, what are you trying to say, preacher? I'm talking about pleasing the Lord. Hmm? It comes through obedience. And our walk and our works, our walks, our attitude, our works, our action, also in our witness. That deals with our accountability. Hmm? How in the world can I tell somebody else they need Jesus if my life doesn't show that I've got Jesus? Hmm? Accountability. You know why there are some people that won't come to church with you? They know you. How are we going to please the Lord? He takes pleasure in his people. Huh? It didn't say he took pleasure in the birds. He takes pleasure in his people. 
I want to please Him. We please Him through obedience. Can I say this? We please Him through overcoming. Can I help you something? The odds are stacked against us. The world hates us. The devil hates us. And your own flesh don't like you being here today. But my dear friends, when you overcome those things, you please the Lord. 1 John chapter 4 says this, verse 4, Ye of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Romans 12, 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Revelation 3, 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. Uh, 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 through the Scriptures and the Spirit of God, we can overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil. Uh, Ezekiel 14, 14 says, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in, the, in it, the world, uh, they should have delivered uh, but their own souls by their righteousness save the Lord God what happened they overcame the world they overcame the flesh they overcame the devil why, why? because God was with them uh, you can overcome too you do not have to succumb to temptation or not have to succumb to anything because the spirit of God lives in you and when you trust him God's pleased can I say this we please the Lord through offering mm -hmm. through the offering of song and praise through the offering of service. A lot of you did a lot of work around here in the last few weeks, and God was pleased. That's why we had such a great camp meeting. Hmm? He honored your service, your sacrifice. The offering of silver. I won't even get on money. I know that will really kill you today. huh? The offering of self. But James sings that song, When I Lay My Isaac Down. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Through offering what you have to God, doesn't matter how big or how little, when you give it to God, He takes it, and He blesses it, and He magnifies it, and He's not only pleased with it, He uses it for His glory. Can I say this? We please God through obeisance. The word obeisance means reverence and respect. I, I, I hate the statement, the man upstairs. I hate the statement, my boss is a Jewish carpenter. I didn't know you was a carpenter. Listen. He's not my boss, he's my Lord. And he's not a Jewish carpenter, he's the king of glory. Mm -hmm. When you see things like that, it is belittling him and taken away from his deity. Obeisance gives him the reverence and the respect that he deserves. The Bible does say holy and reverend is his name. By the way, that's the only time in the Bible you find the word reverend and it's not referring to a man referring to God and I've heard some say well we're God's men and we need to be reverent and no you know what God's men are supposed to be servants mm. listen we show reverence through humility John the Baptist said I must decrease he must increase through humility through homage loyalty and through holiness he says, be you holy, for I'm holy. When we reverence and respect the things of God, God is pleased with it. You realize under the Old Testament economy, even the furniture in the house of God was ordained and anointed of God? Hmm? That will make you think the next time that uh, you leave your fingernail clippings in the seat of the church house. Your chewing gum wrappers in the songbook rack. Do you realize God looks at that as holy? This whole place has been hallowed to His name. Hmm? Huh? Boy, I made him mad on that one. Brother Eric, stand up. Stand up. There's the complaint department. Have any problem? Go talk to him. All right. You didn't know you was the complaint department, but now you do. I thought of one other thing that pleases God. I just want to please Him. He's done so much for me. 
I've been saved 47 years. He's a good God. I ought to be in hell for things I've said and done since I got saved. And all he did was love me, forgive me, pick me up, and put me back on the path called straight. He's a good God. Uh, can I say I've never gone hungry? Hmm. I tried a little diet. Told you all a few weeks ago, dry cleaners are sorry, no good. My collars were shrinking. So I thought I'd help him out. I went on a little diet. was doing pretty good. Went down there to Georgia to preach revival. Every time I stood still, somebody's putting food in my face. You can't offend people, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. And I mean, they took me some of the best places. I mean, these little hole-in-the-walls places, nobody else would know where they were. They took me in this barbecue place. I'm thinking, where are we going to eat? I mean, cars outside, pick it up at the window. We went in his back door. I thought, we're eating in the kitchen. There was a little spot a little bit, about as big as my chair over here. They said they brought food like you would not believe. And I thought, hallelujah unto God. <laughs> uh, just telling you, God's good. Even when I try to lose weight, he just makes me fat. I mean, God's good. He's been good to me. I have no sad tales to tell. You say, haven't you ever had any problems? Yeah, who hadn't? But I got good news for you. Because I'm in him and he's in me, he handles my problems. I don't have to worry about it. He's a big God. I thought about this lastly. How do you please God? You please God through others. See, the whole ideology of Satan is selfishness. My right to my claim to myself. But the whole ideology of God is do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. It's about others. And when you're good to others, it pleases God. Can I say this? How, how can we be good to others? By esteeming others better than ourselves. You know, that'd solve the whole world if we would uh, uh, esteem others better than us. There'd be no racism problem if we esteemed everybody else better than us. Huh? There'd be no other problems in humanity. Matter of fact, the news would go out of business. They'd have no negative stuff to report on. Because we'd all just esteem others better than ourselves. Huh? Now, I want to tell you something. It takes a whole lot of God for you to esteem a Democrat better than yourself. I'm telling you, that takes a whole lot of God. But you know what? Jesus loves them. And Jesus will save them. Brother Doug, you shouldn't have said that. Well, that's better than what I was thinking. <laughs> Not only esteeming others, but by edifying others. I want to tell you something. Behind everybody's nice suit coat or nice dress or nice smile and everything that people brought in here today, there's people that are facing a lot of hard things. But Brian, Miss Brown is getting a lot out of camp meeting until yesterday morning. Found out her mama died. A lot of folks facing hard things, difficult things. As God's people, the last thing we need to do is add to that. What we should do is edify people, encourage them, build them up, help them, bear their burdens, be good to people. Huh? They get enough beating on out in the world. Ought to edify people, build them up, pat them on the back, tell them you appreciate them. Word fitly spoken goes a long way down the road, friend. Edifying them, encouraging them. Pray with them. Tell them how much you care about them. It's important. Not only that, embracing other people. Sometimes we're all subject to find ourselves under a juniper tree thinking nobody cares. There's some of you in here today. You're on the mountaintop today because when you was in the valley, somebody come and put their arms around you, let you know they cared. Mm. You never go wrong doing right to people. Mm. It pleases God when you look out after one of his youngins. And I say this also by entertaining others. You know what I love about our church family? 
Is there not too many weeks go by that somebody's not inviting others over their house and just enjoying one another's company? Look at the eternal friendships we have in our church family. What a blessing. It's all right to open your doors, have somebody over, and feed them a meal, and just spend time fellowship with them. And it pleases God. Now here's the whole thing. Is your life pleasing God? The preacher, I came to church today, was wonderful. I didn't want to ask you. Is your life pleasing God? The Bible says he taketh pleasure in his people. Are you and I pleasing God? If you're here today and you're not saved, you're not pleasing God. The Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. Now listen, friend, what you don't understand is you still being a sinner dishonors him because he gave his only begotten son who died for your sin who was buried and rose again to prove he was God so he could redeem you from your sin and God looks at what he paid for your sin and looks at you still being a sinner it, it makes him angry he's not pleased with you but if you're willing to come to him and confess your sin and repent ask him to save you He'll not only save you from your sin, He'll cleanse you, make a new creature out of you, but then He'll be pleased with you. Then you'll have all the blessings of God. Brother Donald, before you got saved a couple years ago, you didn't know God was angry with you. You just know you knew your life was a mess. But you met Jesus. How's life been since you met Jesus? Yeah, been good, hadn't it? Huh? He's blessed you. you. Used to be lonely. Now you got a whole pew of folks with you every Sunday. I mean, God's been good. Amen. And if that ain't enough, you got another one on the way. Huh? We need to talk, son. God's been good. If you're here today and you're lost, you don't know how a good life can be. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants to bless your life. And it starts with salvation. If you're not saved in a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We invite you to come. We'll take a Bible, show you how to get saved. Be the best day of your life. You say, how do you know? Because I got saved 47 years ago, still hadn't got over it. It'll change your life. A Christian friend, is he pleased? Hmm. We just come through camp meeting. Did you really get into camp meeting? Or did you just kind of Stand and look at it from afar. Is he pleased with you? Is he pleased with your attitude? Is he pleased with your actions? Is he pleased with your work? Friend, he loves you. He'll always love you. But there's something about knowing he's pleased with you. And if your life isn't pleasing him, Friend, you know there's a distance between you and him. And there's nothing worse than a child of God when you're at distance from God. There's nothing better when you're walking hand in hand. So I encourage you this morning, take inventory of your life. Ask the Lord, Lord, are you pleased with me? He'll, oh, he'll let you know. But deep down inside, you already know. Why don't you come this morning get that thing made, made right? There's nothing like knowing God's pleased with you. Why don't you do business with God today? If you're here today not saved, why don't you come? We'd love to introduce you to God. If you're here today and you know He's pleased with you, but you got a burden for somebody, why don't you come pray for them? Maybe during the invitation, God will speak to your heart. Maybe there's somebody here really low and you don't even know it, but God might say, why don't you go put your arm around them, tell them you love them. might be the very thing that helps them, but it also please God. Let's be real sensitive during this invitation. I sure would like to leave out of here everybody being, just knowing that they're pleasing unto God, but everybody leave out here in the glory of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? It all starts with us being obedient. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Folks are coming. Are you pleasing God? If you're here today and you're not saved, why don't you come? We'd love to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. It's nothing like being saved.
Folks are doing business with God. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Or just a little simple message. But very profound to think that the God of glory would take pleasure in his people. Lord, I want to please you. God, I want you to be satisfied with my life. Lord, I don't want you to regret what you paid for my sin. God, I pray now in this congregation, Lord, to every saved person in here to have a desire to please God. God, I pray. Lord, if there's somebody here unsaved, Lord, I pray they'd come give their heart and life to Jesus. Lord, I pray for the Holy Ghost to go by where they are. Through cords of love, draw them to an altar of repentance. Then, God, I do pray. Lord, if there's somebody here low, that, God, you touch one of your youngins' hearts, go by, put their arms around them, and encourage them. God, do a work around here. And, Lord, help us to all leave out pleasing unto God. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.